I'd like to call the I'd like to call the order the um, May fourteenth, two thousand twenty four meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I'd like to introduce the board. Uh, starting at the end, we have Dylan Stella, who's an alternate member. Um, we have Dennis Crow, who's a regular member. We have John Zire, who's a regular member. We have Bill Piggott, who's a regular member. And we have um, Steve Bishop, who is a regular member. My name is Rich Gilbert, I'm the chair. And we also have Maria Patola, who's our zoning officer. Um, four votes are needed for an application to be approved in accordance with state statutes. A simple majority is not sufficient. Um, zoning officer agreed to call the meeting as advertised in the publication. After the applications have been read, anyone who wishes to withdraw or postpone his or her application is free to do so. If there is no one who wishes to withdraw or postpone, we would then go forward with the applications in the order in which they have been advertised. The zoning officer will call the application at which time the applicant or his or her representative will come forward and state his or her name and address for the record and the nature and reason for the appeal. The applicant or representative should stand where he or she can be seen and all displays can be seen by both the board and the audience. Any and all items, plans, or pictures shown to the board are considered exhibits and all exhibits must be left with the file. After the presentation is made by the applicant, we will entertain questions from members of the board and then entertain questions from the audience. We will also, after that discussion has taken place, accept presentations or statements either in favor of or in opposition to the particular application. Please be sure to state your name and address the first time you speak and your name any, any subsequent time you speak. When your application has been heard, we will close the public hearing portion of the application and the board will go into deliberations with the seated members. You're free to stay here, but tempting as it might be, you should not make any further comments, even if you think of something you should have said or wish you had said but didn't. That would take be taken as testimony and according to statute, to statute, we are not permitted to take testimony after the close of the public hearing portion. In most instances, we'll make our decision immediately after each hearing. You may stay to hear the result or call the land use office in the morning. You will also be notified by mail and all decisions are published. I will now call on our zoning officer, Maria Patola, to now read the appeals to be presented tonight. Okay, the first item um, on the agenda was opened and continued um, in the April meetings about legal sonority Um The next two items, uh, legal notice, Madison Zoning Board of Appeals, Madison, Connecticut. Notice is hereby given that the board will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, May 14th, 2024 at 7 p.m. This meeting will be conducted as a hybrid meeting in room A, which was now changed to C today. Uh, town Campus, 8 Campus Drive, remotely as Zoom online webinar. And these may join the webinar from either the web link below or call into the link. www.zoom.us, webinar ID 920-072103, password 38818, or call in at 1646-558-8656. The following Applications will be approved. Application number 2407-55WA-KKA-51 East Street, Judge Village. Map 31, Lot 45, Zone CR2. Owner, Fine and Realty. Applicant, Robert and Patricia, Patricia Sikoski. Variance request per Section 3.6C to allow 20-foot rear yard setback for 30 feet is required per Section 3.8 to allow an increase of lot coverage of 180 square feet for proposed patio roof. Application also includes a coastal site plan. Application number 2408 10 Shoreland's Drive, Map 24, Lot 46, Zone R3. Owner, applicant, Alexander and Anastasia Kane. 
variance request for section 11.1 to allow construction of an accessory building in front yard. The application also includes a coastal site plan. Further details, including application materials, are posted on the town's website, www.madisoncet.org. Under the calendar link to the meeting, questions and or comments can be emailed to the land use office at landuse at madisoncet.org up to 24 hours in advance of the meeting. Dated this 23rd day of April 2024, Richard Gilbert Chair. This was published twice in the source on May 2nd, 2024, and May 9th. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the um, applicant for 240531 Parker Ave. Go ahead and Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Where is the microphone for purposes of the data management? They can hear. It's oh, okay. It's, it's Mike, the room is okay. There's, well. not a, there's not a hand. I just wanted to position yes. myself appropriately. Yes. Um, I am attorney Marjorie Shansky, and I represent the owner of 31 Parker Avenue. With me this evening are one of my clients, Mark Stein, uh, also Greg Pettis, professional engineer uh, who did the site plan, and our architect, uh, Edward Prezanian. Um, we are seeking a variance from the board to reconstruct a non-conforming structure. The subject property is located within two FEMA designated flood zones, the VE zone and the AE zone, requiring adherence to the stricter VE zone standards in the reconstruction, including elevation at 14 plus one above base flood elevation. The applicant was here last year, as you may recall, with a different proposal which garnered a vote of three to one on the variance and a unanimous approval of the coastal site plan. The current application is responsive to the conversation that the board had uh, a year ago or last year, and is nonetheless presented to the board as a reconstruction of an existing non-conforming residence on the existing established footprint. That's one of the distinctions from last year, or well, it was 2023, so if I say last year, that's what I mean. And a zoning compliant garage with additional adjustments that have the effect of reducing nonconformities, which you understand is one of the standards um, upon which granting of a variance can be based. The new home will be FEMA compliant, flood zone ordinance compliant, and code compliant in every respect. Now, to uh, illustrate the dimensional aspects of the proposal, we have included on the site plan a, an R5 zoning requirements table, and I have that in reduced form, which I'm going to pass out to the board if I may. And on this sheet, there is a second chart, which may be interesting to you, which is a comparison of the prior and the existing application. And if I may call your attention to a couple of the highlighted elements of this, uh, the, the higher chart, the upper chart, the R5 zoning requirements table. If you look in the comments section, of course, the section of the regulations is in the far left hand column and the regulation description, the requirements in the R5 zoning district, the existing dimensions, comments, the proposed dimensions, and then sort of the summary. And if you look in the final comments column, you'll see that there's no change to the minimum lot size, which is of course a lot of record, no change to the minimum width because it is a lot of record. The build, minimum building area, is conforming. The minimum front yard is conforming. The minimum side yard is as to the garage now conforming. We have eliminated the non-conformity associated with the garage. And with respect to the house, because we are building on the existing footprint, there's no change um, to that dimension. The minimum rear yard, no change. The maximum building coverage, which is 15% in the R5 zoning district 
was formerly 16% or today existing the 16% and under the new proposal becomes 14.7%. So that is an elimination of a non-conforming. The maximum floor area is conforming, the maximum building height is conforming and the critical coastal setback is conforming by that is no change. It's not conforming, but it's no change because we're building on the existing footprint. So that's for your information. The bottom, okay, so. Sorry. Before I hand over the floor to Mr. Fettis to show you the site plan and have that discussion, I want to emphasize that the only alteration to the existing house is the change to the roof line. That's what brings us here this evening. But it still is within our five standards. I want to talk about the coastal site plan and the response from the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. As you may remember, you voted unanimously to approve the coastal site plan last year. And the report from DEEP last year also found no adverse coastal impacts as a result of the proposed development. Today, we've received a new report from DEEP on this pending application before you. And once again, DEEP has used in conveying its comments, its comments checklist, not a letter. And if you read the comments checklist, it says, we use this form for projects that the Land and Water Resources Division, we will not use this form if it's a project that the Land and Water Resources Division thinks should be denied. Quite the contrary. This report also concludes that there are no adverse coastal impacts associated with the proposed development. That's on page two. And in its summary and recommendations on page three of this report, DEEP recommends two things, ensuring the installation and maintenance of appropriate soil erosion and sediment controls during construction, and ensuring that the elevation of the structure meets FEMA VE standards and local flood management standards. They are, these are two entirely anticipated and appropriate recommendations with which the applicant will comply. The neighbor at 33 Parker Avenue, Mr. John Baviars, wrote a letter to the board dated April 3rd, 2024, which is in the file. I hope you've seen it. Expressing his support for the pending application. Last year, he was in the room. I believe he's not available to be in the room. So he sent a letter this year expressing his support. The neighbor at 29 Parker Avenue does not support this request as she did not prior version. And for this iteration, counsel for the neighbor has weighed in, as has a coastal consultant. And among their claims is that the pool, the swimming pool, which you'll see from your comparison of last year to this year, has been made substantially smaller, all within conforming setbacks. Their claim is that it is a shoreline flood and erosion control structure as that term is defined in the Madison zoning regulations and in state law under the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection statutes. We disagree. The pool does not meet the definition of a shoreline flood and erosion control structure. It is not a shoreline flood and erosion control structure by description, by intent, or by effect. Moreover, after the last application was denied, I spent several months with the town planner, and I think at times with Maria, discussing the parameters of finding the elixir that has a reconstruction that passes muster. At no time were the words shoreline flood and erosion control structure raised by your town representatives in the land use department. And perhaps more importantly, DEEP has reviewed this plan twice, finding no adverse coastal impacts and has at no time raised the issue of the pool 
as a proxy for a shoreline flood and erosion control structure. So we reject that as simply a mechanism to try and influence the board to find a way to say no. When we have positioned this application under your regulations to demonstrate its eligibility for the reconstruction. A FEMA compliant flood ordinance and code compliant structure is consistent with the town of Madison's resiliency goals and affords substantial safety to the owner and to the neighborhood from having a FEMA compliant home. And in his letter to the board dated May 10th, counsel for the neighbor has argued the beneficial public policy of encouraging flood elevation compliant homes to reduce property damage and injury. He says that to the board, rather in support, I think, of this application, and we agree with his assessment. So I will be happy to comment further about the neighbors' submissions after they have spoken, but I ask the board to please focus on the zoning chart the rights associated with reconstruction of a non-conforming structure, which is embedded in statute, and the elimination of non-conformities, all of which contribute to the eligibility of this request for your approval of the variance and the coastal site plan. Do you want to make a comment? Um, all right, then I'd like to turn this over to um, Mr. Stein. Yes, sir. Before you do that, could I? I impose upon you to just, uh, if we could get Maria to bring up the application, I'd like to the application. Because I think it's just good to have the application as the official entry when you can just do it. At your will. Thank you. Okay, so and if anybody in the audience needs to see it, you want to feel free to get up and Take a look and move around if it is necessary. As we're waiting for that, Mr. Stein has a comment or two, followed by Mr. Fettis, and followed by uh, Mr. Frizzelli. Okay. Very well. If you walk us through it. Oh, okay. Well, 31 Parker Avenue, map 15, lot 51, R5 zoning district. There's the owner, there's the agent, me. There's the request demolition of existing non conforming single family residents and reconstruction of more conforming FEMA compliant residents on existing footprint that is smaller and that eliminates non conformities. We are seeking permission to have what we have essentially, which is the non-conforming setbacks as they exist. And then there is a narrative attached to the application. And the coastal site plan, of course. Here are the lot characteristics, but I would offer that they are superseded by the zoning chart in terms of the facility to read and, and understand them under the regulations. That's the standard for each. There it is. Reconstructing an existing non conforming single family residence to create a FEMA compliant smaller home on the existing footprint in the R5 zoning district in Madison. The property is capacious, but non conforming is to lot width, which is a fiscal hardship relating to the land. Yet, in connection with this effort, applicant is eliminating several existing non conformities as shown on the provided R5 zoning requirements table. To wit, a non conforming setback for the garage is being eliminated, and the existing maximum building coverage, which is non conformity and non conforming, is being eliminated. That is to say, the new 
maximum building coverage is now lower than the standard in the regulations. The construction of a FEMA compliant structure on the existing footprint is recognized as having value for a property owner, neighboring properties in the town of Madison in realizing its goals of resiliency and improving public safety. Using the existing footprint of the house for its reconstruction, no existing nonconformities are made more nonconforming. The variance requests, which retain the status quo as to footprint, are to recognize the adjusted headroom by the alteration to the roof line. And importantly, the law protects the continued existence of nonconformities. And a quotation from the Petruzzi case, which is rather the seminal case on the right to continued existence of nonconformities, quote, where a nonconformity exists, it is a vested right which adheres to the land itself. And then Connecticut General Statute 8-2 was amended in 2017. <laughs> A question that Maria had asked me earlier. <laughs> to ensure the clarity of the expression of continuing rights associated with non-conforming uses, buildings, or structures by adding as the next sentence, the demolition or deconstruction of a non-conforming use, building, or structure shall not by itself be evidence of, of such properties, property owners intent to not reestablish such use, building, or structure. We are here because of the roof line. If we were rebuilding the exact existing house, we could do that directly through the building department. Probably with a trip to the Commission for Site Planning, Coastal Site Planning. But in any case, then we have included the R5 zoning requirements table, which you have before you. The notices which were appropriately sent and the receipts provided to the land use office and the assessor's card and all of the other requirements associated with your applications. Thank you. You're very welcome. Mr. Stein. Um, my name's Mark Stein. I'm the applicant's husband. Um, I'll keep the comments brief. I just wanted to thank all of you for your time tonight. Um, we tried to listen very hard to the comments that came from the last meeting, uh, which I think some of you were at. And uh, so without being repetitive, we really just strove to address those concerns by putting the house back on the exact same footprint, reducing the size of the garage to complete, bring it completely within the setback, changing the design of the pool to bring it completely within the setback and further reduce those nonconformities. And I'll just end by echoing Mr. Babiarz's comments, which I really do appreciate. We're trying to do something that we think is really wonderful for the town and for the uh, waterfront area by building a smaller home with a smaller footprint, fewer bedrooms, <coughs> compliant way, I'm proud of, and I just ask the board for the variance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Greg Fettis with Fettis Engineering, an office at 70 Essex Street in Mystic, Connecticut, uh, representing the owner and the applicant, um, professional engineer, licensed in the state of Connecticut, and have uh, been before this board uh, several times over the last few years. Uh, we are we were provided a, a survey and uh, site plan uh, for the subject location. Uh, we turned that into a, a plan set for the for the application. Uh, sheet one is in front of you now, which is a demolition plan. Uh, basically, uh, states that we're going to remove the house, remove all the decking, the walkway, the existing garage, and basically start with a clean slate. A um, uh, couple things to note here: if you take the shape of the the existing house and you take the shape and location of the existing garage. When we flip to sheet two, you'll see one that the house is in the exact same spot. The garage has been reduced and moved away from that side property line. Um, so if we could, uh, and I think we have the zoning table uh, that we've already talked about, but I'll kind of reiterate a couple things on it. 
uh, that's on both sheets. Uh, so you can see now the house is in the, in the exact same footprint, it's kind of uh, twisted just slightly to the property lines, 9.2 on the, uh, the, the Western property, uh, Western property line I'm getting, uh, and then 9.6 on the other side property line. Same location, 20.7 feet from the uh, face of the seawall, and then to the rear it was 100 and uh, change uh, to the rear or the front property line, which is Parker Avenue. Um, so as you can see, the garage uh, is smaller uh, and moved away from this property line to be conforming. Um, uh, the pool uh, also meets the uh, side yard setbacks. Uh, and the associated decking is, is if you if we were to flip back to the first sheet, which you don't have to, Maria, but it, the decking is less uh, than what was on the original. Uh, we have building height calculation, which shows uh, we're in conformity uh, with our height. Um, also on this plan, uh, if, I don't know if you can, uh, you know, I'll just read it off of, uh, if we can zoom into the table, I don't know if it's, yeah, let me just take a copy of that. That way you can kind of look at everything. Um, so I'm just going to reiterate very quickly, lot size, uh, maximum width, minimum building area. Those all uh, were the same and haven't changed. Um, the, the two top ones, minimum lot size and minimum width were non-conforming or no, they were conforming, no change. The lot width was non-conforming, no change. Uh, minimum building, building area was conforming. Uh, the front yard um, was conforming and uh, hasn't changed. Uh, the minimum side yard, this is the garage here, uh, was non-conforming and now it's conforming. Um, the house side yard, Again, hasn't changed. The footprint hasn't changed, so the numbers are exactly the same. No change. Uh, rear yard, no change. Um, that was for both the house and the deck. Uh, and this is another important one: the maximum building coverage. The requirements fifteen percent. It was at sixteen, and now it's at fourteen point seven. So it went from non-conforming to conforming. Uh, the maximum floor area is conforming, was conforming previously, it's still conforming. Uh, maximum building height is conforming. Uh, again, uh, height calculation, uh, two different height calculations there uh, for the average building height and the total building height, uh, which are both conforming. Uh, the critical coastal resource, uh, which is 20.7, again, same footprint. So that has not changed, no change. Um, just do, do you guys do the coastal site plan issues at the same time? I'll do it briefly. It was, it's less, uh, it's more conforming from a coastal site plan from then last time. Um, but some of the bigger issues, uh, the erosion sedimentation control, we have an anti-tracking pad coming into the site off Parker Avenue. Um, sill fence basically surrounding the property on three sides, or actually four sides. It looks like it comes across uh, to the front, um, basically in putting an envelope around the site. So any, any runoff um, would get trapped by that sill fence. Um, we don't expect a lot. The soils are well drained in this area, uh, so you don't get a lot of runoff. Um, some of the other issues are the stormwater. So we have underground uh, infiltration galley located on the side in the side yard for both the house and the garage. Um, so that deals with the first inch of uh, rainwater, which is the 
kind of the standard for uh, residential development. <clears throat> um, so additionally, the the V zone runs the VE and AE line is located, let's say the first third of the house that's on the water side. Uh, therefore, putting um, the structures in the VE zone, uh, so it would be a FEMA compliant um, house, which was reiterated by Deep in their letter, uh, FEMA compliant garage. Um, Additionally, we have a, a compliant uh, septic system, new septic system installed or proposed, uh, which is a thousand gallon tank. And uh, I can't read it off there. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the leaching uh, is compliant with the requirement for a three bedroom house. Uh, the tank size is compliant for three bedroom house. Um, I think we, I think I've addressed everything unless I missed anything. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, yes, sir. This is the pool above ground or in ground? It is above ground. How far above ground? It's about three feet above ground. Um, and I believe there's no piece of those roof line question. Did I hear that correctly? The I think it's variance, variance for roof line. I, I think that uh, the architect will discuss that with you. <laughs> yeah, so this calculation up here is, is strictly by the uh, the regulate the zoning regulation, how it's calculated, and we do meet it. It's in the zoning table, um, so we do meet all of that. Uh, I think, unless there's any other questions, I just want to confirm. That... Yeah, it's about three. I I got it correct. It's about three three feet above, sticking out of the ground. Is there a Benefit in having an above ground pool in that area as opposed to an in ground pool? Uh, is it semi submerged? It's not a deep pool. So, um, is there a benefit that's uh, septic related? Uh, an in ground pool needs to be 25 feet from the septic. So, that's why we're above ground. Considered above ground by the definition of the health code. It's a lab pool. Yeah, this isn't this isn't tank pool. This is okay. Unless there's any other questions, I think we can hear from the architect. Okay. Thank you. The human yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm a head representing the designed uh, the house and, and the uh, This is probably the second or third iteration, but um, I, I, I think I'm here to primarily talk about the so called roof line. Um, the previous house, which is visible in this picture and in this picture, um, the first floor was basically uh, Structure, think of it as the uh, floor plan projected up eight or nine feet. Uh, the second floor, however, uh, was really composed of a combination of sloping roofs. Uh, you can see some dormers that kind of occur in, in unusual places. Um, so we tried to, uh, uh, first of all, 
and we tried to address the idea of more usability on the second level by taking the first level and simply projecting it up. So it really uh, is a carbon copy of the first one in terms of the uh, overall building envelope. So, so um, me, by, by the first one, do you mean the one that was presented last year, the existing building? The existing Existing building. Existing building. All right. The existing building is, is visible. The new building, um, we simply took the first floor, projected it up, and then uh, proposed a much simpler uh, sloping roof, uh, roof model, if you will. Uh, no dormers, just a very simple structure that I think in this picture kind of tries to, uh, at least I, I hope you can see where we try to be a little more contextual and it kind of looks like it's neighbors where there are solid first and second floors and then uh, that's a moment. Um, technicality, there's a minor technicality here in terms of code because we also need windows that were combined with one for the same. And clearly we didn't have that in the structure before, which were basically just I'm going to walk this over to give you a closer look. Just the projected height. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 So the first floor is fourteen feet tall. The first floor elevation. The first floor elevation of is out, right? The first floor elevation is about 16.25. Above, not above grade. No, six, uh, relative to being by the speed of 14. But above grade, it's probably more along the lines of about 10. I think you do that. Yeah. We'll make sure we get there. Is there anything else you want to No, I think yeah. Thank you, Worship. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I'd say Maria was asked you this question earlier because the house is. Existing footprint, so the because variances are on here because of the, because of the got it because it increases the uh, that are going up. Okay, I'm very sorry. I didn't hear your question. He because the house is in the same footprint, he wanted to be had asked just to confirm that the actual variance was full it's because of the it's it's change from roof line change. Oh, okay. so right within the setback area within the setback area. And complying right. with all regulations in the R5 right. district. So, so the way it's worded is a little bit odd because it just says we could make it 9 2 and 9 6, where 9 2 and 9 6 right. already exist. But what it doesn't say, and let me say that is to, to put additional um, height of the building within that section. Well, it refers to Pedro in the narrative. I had many conversations with Attorney Gelderman <laughs> on how to express this uh, yeah. because it's because it is conforming, but because of the change in the roof line now occupies space that wasn't occupied, notwithstanding that it's within the building envelope that gives rise to our visit here. Right. There's a theory or a philosophy that one could debate as to whether that's what the Zoning Board of Appeals is for, especially in a, a sea level rising climate changing world, but we're here under your existing regulations and in consultation with all of your staff and that's what brings us here for the roof line adjustment. Yeah. Pretty good. Understand that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Did, was anyone else going to present? Well, well, I don't believe we have any more presentations, but I'll okay. be happy to rebut the comments from the public. Okay. Sure. Why don't we start with the initial Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a um, Would anyone from the public like to speak in favor of the application? Anyone like to speak to oppose the application? Good evening. Um, my name is Keith Angel. I uh, live at 31 Green Springs Drive in Madison, but I have Offices at 51 Elm Street in New Haven. It's uh, my privilege this evening to represent <clears throat> Leslie Cecil and uh, Creighton Michael, who are the neighbors on the other side of the house, um, 83. And I'm also here with uh, Dr. Jennifer O'Donnell of Coastal Ocean Analytics, who is a coastal engineer who I have address you on uh, some of the coastal issues. But um, my first point that I'd like to emphasize that you have complete discretion to deny the application. No one is entitled to a variance unless the rules are depriving the owner um, of their constitutional right to continue their reasonable use of the property. And that's not the case here. They could renovate this house and not need a variance. Um, and so this house could be updated. Um, it, it wasn't destroyed in a storm. They're not trying to rebuild. They're not being forced to comply with FEMA, um, they could rebuild um, or, excuse me, re renovate the house and make it more comfortable for themselves um, without having to get the variances. Um, now, there is an unnecessary variance here, which is the, the variance for the postal setback. They, since they're taking the house down, it's an opportunity to retreat, to move the house back, which is probably one of the most important of the postal resiliency strategies we have is obviously not making people leave their property, but to the extent they can move back further um, within the property, um, that's a benefit because as we know, the, the area around here is um, increasing in, in, in depth and more increased flooding. Um, in addition, um, the pool is in fact a, a flood and erosion control structure. Um, I'm not surprised the staff didn't mention anything about that because it's not something that's generally um, talked about um, unless you're building a wall. But a flood and erosion control structure can be any structure which is, um, in fact, acts like something that deflects wave energy and um, interferes with the set of transport um, along the shoreline. And in this case, the pool is per it's perpendicular to the water, um, parallel to the two halves on either side. That means if there's wave action and flooding that is going to be reflecting off of that pool. It's three feet above the ground. If this pool were flush, um, it wouldn't have that effect. Um, because it's above ground, it acts like a wall. Um, and it's a solid concrete wall. That's what it does, is it deflects wave energy. Um, and it's fairly significantly long, um, as it's not just a, a planter-sized wall. This is a fairly long structure. So the flooding profile of the property is only getting worse by, by this project. They could move the house back, and if they reduce or re eliminate the pool, the pool is a new structure. Um, and so the pool is basically a trophy pool. Um, it's a very nice looking pool, but it isn't a necessary element of the renovation of the house to make it comfortable and, and livable. Um, and so one could rearrange what they were doing. They could make a smaller pool. They could move the house back and make it at least conforming to the to the coastal setback. And I think that's probably one of the most important points we have here. Um, I note that the, the quote of the Petruzzi case, um, you had a little legal lesson there. The uh, Petruzzi case is irrelevant here. No one is attempting to deprive um, them of the, uh, you know, of their ability to maintain the use as a single family home. Um, in fact, they could continue living here now. Uh, the Petruzzi case is really saying you can't force someone to eliminate their use simply by change in the regs. And because, let's say, if their house burns down, you can't say, oh, they can't, they can't put it back. Uh, they have a right to continue that. But 
they don't have a right to a variance. Um, and, and, and nothing about the property is forcing them to do this configuration. Um, the property is the property. It does have narrow you, you know, setback problems, but they could, in fact, move the house back from the trail. Um, there's nothing preventing them from doing that. That's just a, a desire, not a, not a need. Um, and then, of course, we still have the same issue that we had last time, which is the garage is being claimed to be attached, and it's not. Um, it's attached by a pergola. And I, I raised the thought last time, and I said, you know, what if we just connect it with a two by four? What if we connect it with a closed line? I mean, at what point does it become an absurd or an absurdity to claim that a garage is, is an attached garage when you've only attached it by a pergola, which is basically uprights in a few other pieces on top? It's not even a full breezeway, it's not really considered even structure. And uh, so it's in that sense uh, to claim that it's, it's conforming. Is probably a bit of a thing. Um, um, now, the max building coverage, they talk a lot about that. And yes, our regulations in Madison um, calculate uh, building coverage in a particular way and they exempt things like pools. But this pool is still made of concrete, it's still solid, and it is still impervious. Um, so, to completely ignore that it exists simply because our regulations don't cover it is also a practical issue that one should be aware of that you can say oh yeah we, we, we we've gotten rid of these patio stones i um, mean in, in these little wooden walkways which actually weren't really in, impeding the flow of water um, significantly um, but now you have a solid pool big solid cement structure that's continuous that is going to impact the ability of water to infiltrate certainly within that footprint. um so You've got a couple of things that um, one you could do, which is this project could be redesigned and it could be more conforming in a way that is available to the applicant and in a way that's important to coastal resi resilience. Um, and so with that, I will invite Dr. O'Donnell to uh, address you. And you, oh, by the way, you have her report it was submitted in advance. Um, but she's going to highlight the, the main ones. Hello, my name is Jennifer O'Donnell. I'm the a founder and a principal engineer at Crystal Ocean Analytics, which is a uh, consulting firm specializing. Sorry, can you not hear me? I cannot hear you. And, and I beg your pardon. I couldn't understand the case to which counsel was referring. If you could say the name of the case that he's. It's in my brief issue uh, um, into the file. Maybe at the end we can bring up the brief. Mm -hmm. Is there a best place for me to stand? Yeah. No, you just if you speak. If you just speak a little louder, it'll pick it up in yeah. there. It's coming across here, so. Um, okay. If you want to face that way a little bit too, that's fine. Um. Start again. I'm Jennifer O'Donnell. I'm a founder and a, a principal engineer at Coast Ocean Analytics, which is an environmental um, consulting firm that specializes in the physical processes affecting the coastal ocean environment, in particular in Connecticut. I am also an associate professor of research in the Department of Marine Sciences at UConn and an affiliate member of CERCO, which is the Connecticut Institute for Real Resilience and Climate Adaptation. I have well over 30 years of experience in coastal engineering. Um, I have three degrees in civil engineering. My final degree was from the University of Cambridge in um, England. I also am frequently asked by DEEP to review uh, project plans and advise them on um, various projects that are under consideration. I've been asked by the CECLs who live at 29 Parker Avenue, they're the adjacent property owner to the east, to review the coastal processes, the coastal physical processes affecting the site. Um, could you call up a site plan? I guess the, the, the new plan. Um, 
as has been mentioned, the site is in the VE and the AE zone. FEMA regulations require that it that structures in the VE zone or in a zone, a multiple zone, be um, designed and constructed in accordance with the more rigorous, rigorous um, uh, conditions. So here we have the, the VE, AE, VE, AE zone. VE is um, extreme wave conditions. AE is also wave conditions. In fact, I'm, I printed this out because I don't see the limwa on this. So I want to pass this around. Hold on. Um, the, the, line, the limwa, the limit of moderate wave action. So that occurs off here on the other side of Parker Avenue from the site. And the limit of moderate wave action, which we call the limwa, means that you have uh, 1.5 to 3 feet wave height during the design storm. So that means this entire area will be affected by waves during the design storm, which is what FEMA wants you to design for. Um, the, on the second page, is the, the image that was from the coastal site uh, plan application. And it shows a figure that CIRCA, Connecticut Institute of Resilience and Climate Adaptation, has developed to show where the water will be in 2050. So Connecticut has guidelines for state and municipal um, buildings or plans that say you've got to consider current conditions plus 20 inches or 30 centimeters of sea level rise by 2050. This was um, accepted, adopted in 2018, and they are required to update it every 10 years. So it will be revised again. Um, and so the yellow on this shows the location, the estimated location of um, the, the mean higher high water. So in Connecticut, we have approximately two high tides and two low tides every day. And the high t the, there is a higher high tide and a lower high tide. And there's a higher low tide and a lower low tide. But anyway, the, this, this yellow shows where the estimated um, higher high tide will be in 2050. That means the property will be flooded just the northern part, but there will be floodwaters on this property every tidal cycle in 2050. Estimated. This is what we're going by. There are already Phragmites just over the road. Phragmites indicate that there's marsh wetlands there. As the sea level rise, you've all heard the sea level is rising. There is climate change. There's already marsh and marsh will tend to migrate. So the conditions at this site are only going to get worse. So when you're thinking about, oh, what's happening today? How long will the pool be there? So this property is susceptible to sea level rise, particularly from the marsh. It's going to, it's going to get flooding from the marsh, but it's also going to get wave action. So when you're seeing this yellow line, you have to remember, this is the still water does not include any wave heights. It's just still water. So the, the third one shows what the 10-year storm will be under current conditions. So 10-year storm means uh, it occurs statistically once every 10 years, um, or it has a 10% chance of occurring any year. So already, this site is going to be flooded um, in a 10-year storm. But this also is still water level. It doesn't include waves. So that's why it, we need to think. Sure. Do you have a specific question? Well, you, you said this shows it's going to be flooded. Now, okay. That... So, so you see the, the red line? Yes. The bluer stuff, which is on the upper part, that is, that is what's going to be flooded in a 10-year storm at current conditions. And, and that's mainly coming from the marsh because of 
you know, storm surge, the marsh will flood, this will flood. So the property will be flooded through where the, ex the existing house, which is going to be where the future house is going to be from the marsh. So the pool area is going to experience flooding in a 10 year storm, which is not a big storm. And because of climate change, we are increasing not only the sea level, we are also increasing the intensity and frequency of storms. So the 10 year, the 10 year is just a statistic. It's, it's not specific, it's gonna happen. It could, we could have two 10 year storms this year, we could, might not have one for 20 years. It's just a statistical analysis of how often this storm would occur. But anyone who's been here winter 20, you know, December 2022 or uh, January 2024 realizes we had several significant events that were not, um, not anticipated. So this whole property is going to be affected by wave action up to about three feet in, in less frequent storms and it's, and it's going to be flooding during fairly frequent storms. So that brings us to the pool, which is above ground. And as one of the leading experts in coastal physical processes in Connecticut, it is a shoreline flood and erosion control structure. Now, I know Deep didn't think it was. Maybe they did not look at it carefully enough. It was not called out as an above ground pool. It's just a proposed pool. So you'd have to really look at the plans to think about well, we've got a raised deck, so the pool can't be in ground because you wouldn't have your deck three feet above the pool. You'd have the sides of your pool reach the deck. So then we have walls all around here. We know this area is going to flood. Where's that water going to go? Well, it's going to be pushed onto the adjacent property, or you're going to have the flood pathways are going to have increasing flow through here. So as Fluids go through a smaller area, they speed up. Faster flows, more erosion. So you're gonna have more erosion at the ends, depending on where the flood comes. You're gonna have waves. The waves, when they hit a, a wall, they reflect or they splash over, depending on how high the water is and how big the waves are. So the pool is going to have the effect, which according to Connecticut, any structure that has the purpose or effect of which to control flooding or erosion from tidal, coastal, and navigable waters is a flood and erosion control structure. So we have that. The other interesting thing, there's been a lot of discussion about <coughs> the, the house and meeting FEMA regulations, which it does, no question there. And, that, and that's a good thing, you know, it's great because it will cause less problems. There's no discussion about the FEMA regulations of the pool, which also exist. There are guidelines for pools in flood um, zones. The other thing, if, if the house is attached to the garage, then the entire structure, because it's an attached structure, has to meet the VE guidelines, which is because it's in, it has to meet the most restrictive guidelines. Um, I guess that pretty much covers what, what I think. Um, as Mr. Ainsworth mentioned, the zoning regulations only use coverage for the house and the garage, but it doesn't consider the impervious coverage of the entire site. The pool is going to be an impervious coverage. The decking is going to be about a 50% impervious coverage. Um, and you've got other structures in here that are going to limit how much drainage of flood waters you have. Potentially, you could have increased uh, longer lasting flood waters on this and the adjacent sites. Um, and so I, I guess, when building in a coastal zone, you want to think about what, not just what the conditions are today, but for the life of the project. Will this become a problem now? Yes, during storms. If we have a storm, it, it could be, become a problem. But it will become much more of a problem 
as we continue. And 2050 is a lot closer than we think. So does anybody have any questions? Um, you indicated the limb one is one and a half to three foot waves. Yeah. I, I have a hard time envisioning that just in terms of um, what's the base underneath the wave necessary for the wave to actually. So, so wave height, can I put this down here? Yes, sure. So a wave height is measured from the trough to the crest. Right. So you've got the still water. Right. And so it will be one and a uh, um, <laughs> not doing my math, up to one and a half feet above the still water level. Doctor, right. No, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we just it's lost a member. Can, can we have yeah. can I motion for, I, I apologize, can I motion for a five minute break? Okay. Does that answer the question? No. no. Oh. <laughs> we'll, get back, we'll, we'll get back to it some okay. second. Yeah. Get some but, second. Second. in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you, but oh, that's fine. Yeah, sure. I probably do. Yeah. Actually, while well, he's going to do that, I can't do it. Well, well, you're right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The reason we want to hear about that is we're going to have much more frequent use of weapons. That's that's the problem. And it's more than the book. But I guess the yeah, I don't have one. Yeah, I don't have one. I should have given one to each of them. So I'll give it to them and they can. Um, it's just really interesting. It finds this information on the CT Eco site in the sea level rise viewer. Um, after this year, so it's supposed to one of their goals is to explain things to usually municipalities to help them plan for the future. So they do a lot of research into the effects of climate on Connecticut. I'm sorry, there's a record being created here. Could you just refrain? I'm sorry, he asked me a question. Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to speak to him privately. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, a six copy. Yes, thank you. Because I want to be nice to hear that. Okay. Polite. I, I, I stole Steve's. Steve's. Okay. Somebody else wants to hear that. I could have done, you want to resume? Yep. Sorry about that interruption. Okay. Okay. All right. So you established that the, the peak is um, half the total wave height above the still water. Yeah. How high does that still water line have to be in order to sustain a wave height that's this big? Um. It can't be just, it, you know, it, here's the ground, here's a foot and a half, here's a foot and a half. It has to be like 
it's, double that, doesn't it? Doesn't it have to be like three feet? It, it depends on the wavelength. It's the wavelength to the wave height. So as waves approach shallower water, the wavelength gets shorter, and so the waves get steeper. And so when they get a certain uh, steepness, then they break. Right. And so... Which is about twice the height of the wave? Yeah, it, it could be. It's um, slightly less than that um, because it's okay. relative to the wavelength. That. But I'll accept that. So, yeah. so you would need a certain amount of water to get a three foot wave. So, like six feet. Yeah, I didn't look to see what the, so, the flooding in this area is during a design, um, you know, what the surge would be at that, at that point. It's called four feet. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. But you would have to have four feet of water there in order to have the wave you're talking about. And, and if you've already got four feet of water, that three foot wall is not. Actually, it will, because what happens is as a wave hits a structure, I mean, everyone has seen a wave hit a seawall. You know, it hits the seawall, it goes up, it splashes over. Or the other thing that happens is it reflects and waves add. So if you have an incoming wave and an outgoing wave, you now have twice the wave height. You get twice the, the trough as well, because they're additive. Perfect, but... Perfect storm is a story. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't read that. I had friends who, who were involved in that. So I'll take your word for it. All right. I, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I just have trouble envisioning um, with that much water there, it would be how, how much added damage the pool would be as opposed to what it's already occurring anyhow. Um, I, I just I, I just don't see it yet. I have I'm not disputing it. It 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 will increase the damage, but you gotta remember it's gonna be affecting it from low as you go up. So it's not just the three foot wings that's gonna cause problem. You can act your your flood pathways are constricted as well. So the water that comes has to go somewhere. And if you constrain it, then it's going to speed up through the narrower areas, or it's going to go to the adjacent properties. So, so, so and, and one final question. Um, these waves, I mean, the way I see this, it looks like the flooding is coming in from inland, in the marsh area, between Parker and Surf Club Road. In that one, where you're looking at the surge, it does not include the effects of any waves. That is simply a sea level rise plot. You would okay. also have waves coming in, but this is from the CT eco site okay. because that's what the, the coastal site plan used. And so I just wanted to it's make it waves, clear what was showing. So, so you're You'd still have waves, waves as well. To be coming in from, from the front of the building towards the back. Depending on what surge is associated with it and how high the seawall is. I don't know. I don't think the seawall is really high in front. Um, maybe three or five feet. I'm not sure. Um, so so in a, in, a, in a storm, if the surge is high enough, the waves can hit the seawall and they can splash over, and then the water will continue on, but it, it will be shallower or less then. But once the surge is higher than the seawall, then it can come quite up, right over. The water is coming from the marsh side, right? The plot shows the sea level rise. It does not show any waves. So in a, in a, in a one in 10 year storm, I did not check to see what the surge would be at that site. So it could be that the surge is below the height of the seawall and the flooding will only be coming from the marsh. Okay. Um, I, so could have, we, I could have shown, so you know, if you go to the site, you can see the, the third year. Probably applies to the surge. Of the design um, wave, which I think is the, the hundred year storm. So it's a bigger storm than what's shown there. I mean, the 30 year storm, it's gonna be, the whole site is gonna be wet. Um, 
It's, it's right. going to be flooded. But this is just a 10 year. So this is a more frequent event. Um, the 100 year is when you get the limwa to come into effect because that's at the, the design and FEMA designs for a 100 year storm. Okay. Tom. I don't know if this is relevant or not, but is it possible to drain this pool before a major storm? Um, you could, but that's not going to really help you a whole lot because it's still impervious and it still has walls. And where are you going to drain it to? I mean, that's 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 the thing with this plan. There's no discussion of how the pool is designed, how it's going to be drained. You know, all of those kind of questions are not included. So you can assume that they meet the FEMA guidelines, or you can assume they were not considered. You don't know from the plan. I mean, the plan doesn't even specifically click call out that it's above ground pool. You have to really look at it and go, wait a minute, it has to have three foot walls to reach the decking. Has the pool been permitted yet? I beg your pardon? Has the pool been permitted? We're here. This is our first stop. Yeah. They still have pull permit. Yeah. May I ask you a question? Uh, Shansky, sorry, can I pronounce your last name? Shansky. Shansky. The variance request, is the pool included in that or is that just for the... The pool that's, is, that's on, is pool? zoning compliant. Okay, so I think everyone needs to keep that in mind here that these are all relevant questions and discussion points, but that, that's more of a zoning issue. We have two questions before us, 3.60 and 2.17. We're not, certainly not experts in erosion and, and, and drainage. And I, I think we all need to keep that in mind as we discuss this, that the, the, the pool is compliant with the setbacks. So it's just need to know if it's our prerogative, frankly. So Mr. Chair, um, yeah. I believe the discussion of the pool is addressed to the coastal site plan. Which applies to this application, which is um, already been approved. Is it? Uh, it was approved for the last application, but not for this. Which one. had a bigger pool. Uh, you have an opportunity to review this record and yes, this evidence, and, we'll, and we will. We're going to. We will review the site. So it is relevant. Mm -hmm. Other members of the public. Uh, would anyone else like to speak in opposition? Well, I'm Leslie Cecil. I'm the neighbor at 29 Parker. Can you speak up, Ms. Cecil? I said I'm Leslie Cecil at 29 Parker Avenue, the neighbor. And I just want to say that we are concerned about any structure that would increase the flooding and um, the, you know, storm damage to our property. And I think it is a real concern and I think it's all part of the plan because they have the pool, the decking, the quote connection to the making the attached garage, all of that. I mean this is all that is being presented. I'd also like to speak in opposition. Do we have anybody online? Oh. Anybody online? Well, there's people online. Nobody's raising their hand to speak. Well, we haven't asked them. No, Nobody. Nobody's raising their hand. Yeah. Do, do we want to review the new site plan before we? The applicant be able to do that for us. The new site plan. Just. Did you want to go over the site plan the, again? Not oh. the site plan. I'm sorry. Oh, coastal. coastal. Oh, coastal, uh, oh, coastal report. Yeah. 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 I want to talk a little bit about it. If I missed something. Uh, so, I there you've heard nothing new here. Because in his summary and recommendations and his analysis, in pardon me, Marjorie Shansky for the record, based on the information provided, the applicant is proposing the demolition of current residence and the construction of a new three-bedroom single-family home that complies with FEMA standards. 
The property falls within two FEMA designated flood hazard zones, VE elevation 14 and AE elevation 13, requiring adherence to stricter VE zone standards, including elevation to the base flood elevation of 14 feet plus one foot. This parcel is within the limit of moderate wave action line, the LIMWA. This is a fact known to the DEP viewer and expressed in his report. Thus, the applicant should follow the town's flood management policies to ensure the safety of the occupants of property. The property has a stormwater system located on the property. This will be utilized along with the site's sandy soil for stormwater management on the site. And as Mr. Fennis said, captures the first inch of water, which is the DEP goal for stormwater management on a, on a property in the coastal zone. So this is all known by the um, DEP reviewer. And I repeat that this plan, both the prior iteration and this iteration, the prior iteration having a bigger pool that did seek a variance to site itself, passed muster without comment. On page two, Adverse impacts on coastal resources, none through the entire column. Degrades existing circulation patterns of coastal waters, not applicable. Increases coastal flood, flooding hazard by altering shoreline or bathymetry, not applicable. So this has had a thorough review at DEEP. I will also say that on page three of the comment checklist from DEEP is a box labeled issues of concern. See summary and recommendations box for additional detail. Nothing is checked. The, the box on insufficient information, potential increased risk to life and property in coastal hazard area, adverse impacts on future water dependent development, proximity of disturbance to sensitive resources, need for additional vegetated setback, potential to cause erosion, sedimentation, water quality and or stormwater impact, other coastal resource impacts, other, nothing is checked. Nothing is checked. Nothing has changed since the review by the prior coastal heat reviewer um, and is contained within this report. Do you want to add anything? I would just comment a couple of things. Uh, Greg Fettis, Fettis Engineering, if you want me to, I'll talk about a uh, 10 year storm, 100 years. Yeah, storm, that'd be and, great. And then I'll come back to talk about comments from the council. Uh, Greg Fettis with Fettis Engineering, uh, professional engineer, state of Connecticut. So there's a lot of information that came um, from the other expert. Uh, our plan complies with FEMA, the Madison Flood Ordinance, and the zoning regulations with the exception of a couple of variances we've asked for. Um, so Long Island Sound is uh, where I'm standing. Uh, wave action is going to be coming from this side. It's the 100 year storm we're talking about. So uh, VE 14 line is here. AE 13 is on that side of it. Um, the still water for and I don't I'm, I'll be straight up. I don't have the exact number of the still water for a 100 year storm at this location. It's not 14 feet, it's not 11 feet, it's something less than that. Uh, so your question to what happens in the 100 year storm, just to simplify it, you have a VE 14 zone and you have a three foot wave breaking at that line. So what would the still water be? Still water would be worst case 11. So that wave action falls underneath the lowest structural member, you're on piers, the building's on piers, the pool's on piers, decks on piers, 
The garage is on piers. Everything's on piers here because we're in the limited way of action area. Um, we're not at the point of designing the house at this point. We're saying it's FEMA compliant, but we're not going to spend the money to, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to design a foundation if we don't get past this point. Um, and that's typical. The building department looks at that. They look at, they take another look at FEMA compliance. This is strictly for coastal site plan. Um, so you get a wave coming up. Uh, there's a seawall. Uh, that's actually at elevation 9.5. So it's not three or four feet tall. It's, it's at elevation 9.5. So you have wave action and still water, which is probably right around that 9.5, 10, 11, somewhere around there. I'm, and again, I'm not claiming I have that number. Um, it's somewhere in the deep, in the deep archives. Um, and it varies throughout uh, coastal Connecticut. Uh, so you got a three foot wave and a hundred year storm, not a 10 year storm, not a 30 year storm, uh, breaking at this point and going underneath the house and it's all headed in this direction. It's not headed in this direction. Um, the deflection from, first of all, there's a couple of different ways to design a uh, pool per FEMA regulations. Uh, we chose an above ground. Um, we're allowed to make it like you have breakaway walls in a house. You're allowed to have breakaway walls in a pool. So as long as it doesn't damage property. So as long as that pool is designed to come apart and not, you know, if uh, 29 Parker or 33 was sitting back here, and it was going to be launching projectiles at it, maybe I would uh, consider that to be a, a, a threat to their properties. But, but it's not. The wave action is strictly in this direction. And it's not going to change much by a 10 foot wide pool that's going to come apart in a 100 year storm. And don't forget right here, three foot wave, that's the line. From there, it's less. Um, is there anything else? I think we're good if you have any questions. Further to that point, this is Attorney Marjorie Chance for the record. Further to that point, uh, Dr. O'Donnell said she didn't know um, what the uh, wave action was at this parcel, didn't know the height of the seawall, seemed to be a lot of particular information relating to this property that she didn't know. So I would suggest that, and, and, and your comment back to her that she had established whatever you said she had established, she hadn't really established it, she had argued because she doesn't have the particulars. She didn't share with you the particulars. I'm sure she's a knowledgeable individual, but this proposal has had not one, but two reviews up at deep and has been complied, has been designed and will be designed to meet FEMA standards. And as Mr. Fettis said, this will all happen under the building code at time of construction. And should something not meet FEMA standards, it won't be built or it will be made to comply with FEMA standards. So that's the safeguard from that perspective. And indeed, this board did approve the coastal site plan and there have not been a material, there has not been a material change of circumstances that would under the law give you the latitude to alter that decision. We have a consistent, that is the law, and we have a consistent um, review and conclusion from the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. With respect to um, Council's comments, it's not what he says that is problematic, it's what he doesn't say. There is a right to reconstruct this house on this footprint. And there's a right to seek the single variance that's being requested 
And in support of that, they've eliminated nonconformities, which under Pestock, Sancuna, um, and Vine, and other cases, supports the proposition that the elimination of nonconformities is an independent basis for granting a variance. This is a very modest request that will result in something that the town wants, which are flood FEMA compliant structures that lower the risk to life and property in the event of a debilitating storm. It meets the regulations. The other comments that council is making, well, you know, this is really, I disagree with the interpretation of the regulations. Well, I'm sorry, this is the way Madison interprets its regulations. This has been vetted through the town planner and through the zoning enforcement officer. The pool is not part of the coverage. It is not under your regulations and we don't enforce future regulation. We enforce existing regulations. We don't enforce practical realities. We enforce the regulations. The whole predicate of the Zoning Board of Appeals is based on deviations from the regulations, not from esoteric ideas of what would be better. There may always be something better or different, and that is the continuous goal of reframing and modifying and amending regulations. But under today's regulations, we are presenting to you a elimination of nonconformities. We are presenting to you a zoning conforming structure and a rebuild of an existing nonconforming structure. And we urge the board to view it positively and approve it. Do you have any other questions? Board have any questions? Mm -hmm. Any final questions from the public or comments? I'd like to motion we close the public portion. Are you sure you asked for more? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Could I get it? I move that we close the public hearing and move on to deliberations, please. Any second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Who would like to start? Um, I'm inclined to prove it. Um, I've, I've heard the arguments against it, and I perceive that a lot of those are based upon speculation that given a particular storm, cool, they may be more damage to someone's property. It's purely speculative. It wasn't, it wasn't a real substantial evidence that there would be ways that would be existing in that area or that or that they would cause the damage. Yes. And then I would see that. Speak up. Okay. So I haven't seen an indication of anything other than some speculation that waves would reach a certain height back there and that they would reflect off the pool and somehow cause damage. I, I don't I don't see that as more than speculation and um it, it could happen but I don't believe it's our job to um, uh, deal in speculation I believe as as the applicants uh, council has stated we got to go by the regulations and the regulation asks for the uh, an offset an increase of the uh, building height within the offset area. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I tend to agree with Dennis. I I, I think that uh, if there is going to be a, a serious uh, flood, which I presume there will be, uh, I think the pool that all area will be smaller. So I don't think that the pool of this size will have any effect in, in that nature. But some of the uh, non-conforming uh, issues have been corrected, which I think is uh, in line with the need to be done support the application. Uh, 
I think we have to go by what the regulations are today. And uh, I know on the last application, we approved the coastal site plan and uh, it's been approved again. And I have to defer to them for their advice on the coastal site plan. And they approve it. And you people have shown an improvement in your application. Uh, you eliminated some non-conformities too, I believe. And you also have the invested right, you know, to build on the existing footprint and keep that non-conformity well that you have. And by reducing the two non-conformities, uh, you've made the property more compliant. So I would tend to approve the application. Well, today, we'll, I think we have to kind of take a step back. So there's the, what we're supposed to approve from the clearances, which is building the existing reduction in common non-conforming. That's a basis that we always approve on here. And we haven't passed unless there's something odd about it. So I don't see any issues. I think they further not existing. They're reducing our facilities. And based upon my experience here and everything else, the rules and laws we follow, that is something that I would be 100% in favor of. The coastal resource, I don't want to go. I think we have to rely on experts. We're not the experts. We, if there's some question, we can ask our council. I don't think that's important in this case. Is it the EPA? Proved it twice, so I would be in favor of it. So, yeah, I, I agree with everybody has said here. Um, I just, I, I did want to say I did appreciate the testimony from uh, Dr. O, O'Donnell and, and, and Attorney Ainsworth, and I, I understand their point on why it's relevant because the pool. It's part of the overall coastal site plan. Um, however, the I, we do have to rely. Um, the DEP is our is our official body um, that we we always go by. Um, there are no variances requested for the pool, so I, I tend to not let that the pool influence my decision. And, and like you guys. Have, already pointed out um, there were two two reductions in non-conformities for the garage and for the maximum building coverage and the house is being built in the existing footprint. So I would be in favor. Disagree. I'd like to ask you, we don't have the best statement of the argument on the variance itself. I, I hope what you said. Did you want to put that into a motion? I'm sorry, Dex. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you had the best argument that discussed the actual variance request. Yeah. Would you like to put that in a motion? Yeah. Okay. So we have to. Yeah. I just, we have a new coastal site plan. So we. We'll do that as a second. Okay. For the variance. All right, so you want me to make a motion? For the variance itself. So. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I make a motion to approve the variances request on, on application 2405 13 Park Parker Avenue, map 15, lot 51, zone R5, owner applicant, B Marsh trustee. Uh, variance request to let me read that. I got it. Just got it. There it is. A variance request to allow nine point two feet west and nine point six feet east where 
9.2 west and 9.6 feet east exist and 12 feet are required to reconstruct smaller FEMA compliant house on the existing footprint and section 2.17 to allow critical coastal resource setback for 20.7 and 20.7 exists and 50 feet is required. Application includes coastal site plan and the and the variances on the basis of the elimination of non-conformities on the west garage setback and the building lot coverage. In addition, the existing remaining non-conformities can be retained because the new FEMA compliant resident is on a existing footprint of the demolished structure. I'll second. Can I amend that the variance is based on the plans it has submitted and that all construction must conform right. to those plans? Can all do you second? I'm still second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Pass unanimously. Shall we do the coastal? Um, yeah. Second. Sure. Um, I move that the coastal site plan um, application for 31 Park, uh, or 24 Donald by 31 Park around uh, be approved based on the uh, approval of the former bureau and the, um, the goals and policies. What are the rules and policies? Of our current um, coastal coastal management plan. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you very much for your consideration. Sure. Congratulations. Thank you. That was quick. <laughs> yeah, that was only an hour. <laughs> Thanks for your continued attention. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you want to pause again? Do you need a break? I don't. I just didn't know. Sorry. Go right in. Okay. Right. I'd like to uh, move we be real from the other portion to here. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd like to, uh, whoever is going to present our case. 4 07 55 lovely lane, please okay. come forward. If there I, can't, is. I, I can't hear in here. Uh, so I'm John Matthews. I'll speak loud so somebody can hear me. My architect, my office is 817 Boston Post Road, and also town resident for 50 years. Uh, we were before you back in. March for, for this particular project. And uh, it's a really interesting situation, these three villages out there. Uh, there are three lots. You know, this particular one is like eight and a half acres. It has 96 cottages. The only zoning rules there that you can really apply in the code are front, rear, and side set. There's no regulation in our code that tells you how to figure coverage. There, there isn't any. If you refer to 3.8, which has that chart, and you take eight and a half acres, you could do a total, and I did the math on this, it took a while, you could do a total of like a 9,000 square foot building on the eight acre lot. Of course, if you divide that by 96, that would mean each building could have 100 square feet, which is kind of ridiculous. So, so the whole situation here is each one of these cottages has a lease, and the lease has a defined area 
on the lot. However, it's not a property line. It's a lease line. And our wonderful zoning code doesn't recognize that. It only recognizes property lines. So it's an impossible situation to deal with coverage. There really isn't any reg regulation that tells you what you can or can't do for coverage. Now, what we have is that we have an existing seasonal cottage. It's like 672 square feet. And when it was built and rebuilt in 2011, it was a 14 by 28 concrete patio that was poured. And this overlooks Salt Meadow Park. And then Salt Meadow Park did a survey of that property line and defined where that actual property line is. Uh, then there's a trail in Salt Meadow Park, but it's 30 feet into Salt Meadow Park. So what we have uh, from our existing building, we have like 30, uh, 30 feet to the property line. And this patio is, is 10 feet from the property line. So our proposal is to put a roof over the patio and for a number of reasons. Uh, it's a seasonal cottage. They don't only use it in the summertime and we sit outside. Mr. Tchaikovsky, who is here, and I'll show you some medical stuff, has had a real issue with sun cancer. And I'll give you some documentation. I have a couple of photos I'd like to just show you, but not necessarily leave you to see how bad it got at one point. So our feeling is that if I looked at this as a lot rather than a lease line, you know, we're looking at like 118 square feet of coverage, you know, that we would need a variance for. But but there is no rules for that. And then we talked to Maria the other day, you know, it, it's up to you guys. You know, you guys make the rules for coverage in these villages, which I think is something personally that the town should address and they just turned their back on it for 60 years. There's not a conforming building down there, in my opinion, and almost half of them have covered patios or, or covered porches like we're proposing. So it's not something that's you know, unheard of in, in the neighborhood. And so, so th this is East Street. This is our lease line here, okay? Right there. Uh, there's 30 feet up to the Salt Meadow Park Trail. So this is that existing concrete patio. Let's go to the next slide. For the, uh, the next oops. site plan. Well, th this is the lot, and yeah. so you have a rear set rear setback. You have a side, a side, and a front, and you have ninety six cottages scattered in into that that L shaped piece of property. Uh, and it's all in, well, most of it's in the R2 zone. Part of the is in the C zone. So um, let's go, go to, we get to the real, what are you looking for? Yeah, just keep going. Well, that's it on this one. So um, what are you looking for? They're on different PDFs. Yeah, the site plan that shows the porch and stuff. If not, I'll hold my board up. The same one. It's a There's your, your, you don't want your plan plan, right? There were four sheets that were submitted with, with the application. I've got 15 documents. I don't know what they're, what, what are you looking for? That's, 
they're all entitled to something different. The existing site plan. I'm looking for the P one goal. Copy of it there. Yeah, you can show it because I don't. So. Oh, his drawings, your drawings, not the same. Uh, I don't think you can really read that. So let me just show oh, everybody this. this. I'll walk around. This is the P1 drawing right here. Uh, this is the back of the existing house. This is the patio right here. What we're proposing is put four sauna tube columns down by the edge of the patio, put four columns up, and then do a slope roof, which goes over the existing roof out to there. It would be an ex exposed construction these would be two by six tongue and groove decking on the roof, which would be left exposed, so it's natural wood. Uh, but th this would give the Sukoskis shade over this patio, which is something that uh, doesn't exist today. It's just wide open out there overlooking the salt and water park. And, uh, also, I'm going to walk around. This is the back of the house today. This is looking at it from Salt Meadow Park. This is looking north. This is the up the two houses up from us. The existing house is built six feet off the property line. You know? Uh, this is a typical structure that has patio with, with a court to it, and there's tons of them. Let's have a couple more of those to show. They just keep going. All of these houses, somehow somebody's enclosed this one, but these are all open. Most of them are open patio. porches. And it's interesting in the zoning code, if you have a roof over a patio, the entire roof coverage counts. But if you have an open roof over a porch, only half the coverage, which makes absolutely no sense. In my opinion, again, these are just some of the existing structures in the theater. So, what we're proposing is certainly not out of character with what's in the neighborhood. It's going to provide my client the ability. To enjoy his here's, here's a prescription medication he was taking. He tells all about it. And these are pretty gruesome photographs I'm gonna show you. And uh, this is What's, what's happening? I don't think it, I don't think it's necessary to show this. Right. So, uh, well, I don't. I'm sorry. It's not. We're not asking. I mean, we're not medical. No. But, 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 and that's not pertinent. 
Well, it's pertinent for us. For our it's hardship. pertinent to her. Pertinent. But it's not to us right now. It's pertinent for us for a hardship for putting this roof up where they can enjoy their property and sit outside and not have to subject to covering themselves up with food. Won't submit this to the record. No, this is a medication. This is the one prescribed to use. So, are there any questions? Mr. Matthews mentioned that the skin cancer is your is your client seeking relief under. Americans with disabilities, or no, just saying, I've got, I've got this hardship, and I've got this condition, and it's a hardship for me to enjoy my property. I thought this is somewhat out. I'm going to sit out here in the blazing sun from Salt Meadow Park. It's a happy part. It's really a dilemma about coverage. You know, what, what to do with it? It's up to you guys to say, is this a reasonable request to put a porch up over the existing project to provide shade and color for the owners? As far as the coastal side plan, I don't think we have put some file. There's no issues for the coastal side. I'm not sure that we heard back from DEP at the first time around that I think they replied because we never saw the file. So, but the first application, we didn't know what to do with coverage. So, we didn't ask for coverage. We just asked for the setback for the court. The sign we're asking for the set back to the port and for COVID. So, any questions or any? Start with initial questions from the board. There's something about having the cover or something like that. Cover point is the cover from the board. I can hear. What are you saying? Yes, they 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 addressed it as a covered patio. The covered porch counts as fifty percent covered. You know, covered patio counts as a hundred percent. But either way, they had not asked for any coverage last time. Now they are addressing that, so they corrected that from last time. So we're asking for hundred percent coverage of the existing patio. And from a, a coastal situation, doesn't increase runoff. The patio is the same as a roof. And we're only digging four of these uh, sonic tube poles of this silt finishing. From a coastal site point, no issue. Can you update on the coastal site plan? Um, you know, I know that 31 parker came in very very late and sheldon i, I normally don't get them as she would forward them she gets them and folds them on she told me about 41 parker i don't think so and she would have forwarded them. Let's see. no we got no response from dbk we did last time though. i think there was last time no, I yes, there I, was. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think there was any negative thing right. last time. Okay. Yes, they responded last time. Yeah. In March. They did not respond this time. More questions to Dennis? Sure. Any questions? Yeah. Um, any, uh, Comments from anybody who'd like to speak in favor 
or against the application? Anybody online? Raising their hand? Not raising their hand, no. Okay. Are you here? Um, further final questions from the board? Okay. Um, I'll make a motion. We okay. close the public hearing for this. Any final comments, no, Mr. Mendes? Ask for your uh, guidance and notes. Is it that difficult situation? Yeah. I'll make a motion to close the uh, public hearing on this case and move to deliberations. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. I'd like to start. Plus, I mean, I was for it the last time. For it again this time. I don't think, think anybody in that eight and a half acre area is in a hardship. And I think yeah, our job is to it's not to be restricted. I think we go large of the, you know, I don't care about the medical thing, but I think people deserve to have a body in the back door if they want one. What do you see? What do you see as a hardship? I think the hardship is that the lot size or whatever perceived lot size is undefinable. Therefore, it's a hardship. And in the case of the house, it's undefinable in the zone. And therefore, you know, the hardship is an unconforming lot. But they can't really do it. You know, they can't build anything. So I think that it matters. I would I would favor of it. I think we have the latitude of the board to express the rules sometimes. And this is one of those cases I would do. Thank you. Well, well last time I voted against it. Uh, I I don't see a legal hardship here. No, I sympathize with the client, you know, with a medical condition, specifically cancer. And I completely understand that. But as a board, we have to go by what the parameters we have. And unfortunately, as the rules stand now, um, a medical hardship is not considered as a legal hardship for us to make a judgment on. This is a tough one because I sympathize with the client. Um, have you considered that we can? You, you've closed the public Wait, hearing. So yeah, we we closed the public portion of the hearing. We can't. Oh, well, I'm sorry. All right. You can I would consider maybe a temporary structure. I mean, I mean, she's only going to be there in the summertime, maybe three months out of the year. And maybe you could put up a temporary yeah, body. body. I mean, maybe we could put up a temporary, or maybe they could put up a temporary on it and make it temporary, not attached to the building. And I'm sure there are a lot of products out there where you can roll it out, roll it in, and that could even be attached. I'm sorry? That could be attached. Yeah. What do you think of Steve's argument that the predated, pre, the lot predated zoning, and therefore size, irregularity, shape, and impossible? True. However, on the lot, can we consider that a lot? Because it's least lines? No, you can't consider their their portion. You don't recognize least lines, but it's the lot as the whole. Okay. And doing, you know, the quick math, you take your acre and you multiply it by eight and a half, it's like 300 something thousand square feet. If you gave it a 10% coverage, mm -hmm. that means each, each cottage would be about 650 ish or, or so square feet. But that's just, that would be making it up for the for the lot. But they can't recognize, we can't recognize the lease lines, just the actual property lines. Okay, because I was going by the application here, 
be factored. It exists 672, that, and now we're at 1,078. So well, that's true. No, that's true. That? That's true. Their their structure is 672 square feet now, the yeah. square. And once they add the covered patio, it's going to increase to 1,078. So is that a legitimate increase? In coverage, yes. They're increasing the okay, coverage. Okay, because... Yes. Because and that's what they're asking for is the very I know, but, but, yeah. his, no, but his concern was how do we determine what the coverage is? Because there's there's a question of the lease lines, and can you right. really consider it? It's it's hard to, it's just an increase in coverage. Okay. Can I can I oh uh, yeah, please do. I don't I I very much disagree with the um, objective. Of we are responsible. We have that authority. I believe that the owner of the property and the town are are you know in in a situation here where they need to resolve it. And it's not up to the board to resolve it. We can't simply go doing our own math and figuring out lot sizes and the percentage of the overall eight and a half acres it is, and therefore we can go to this much and so on. That, that's out of our hands. The town's got to go for their own. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's my perception. Yeah. No, that's a good point. No, I agree. And I, as far as I know, I've replaced it with the money of 620,000. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's and that whole area. Is it's just out of, different yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, I mean, it's, it's way, almost out of control. Was, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's way over. over yeah. When did it saturated. Yeah. Saturated. Lot size. So, yeah. The town has to address that. Yeah. John, so, right. Sorry. So many regulations have been in place in 1734. Excuse yes. me, we're, 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 we're deliberating. <laughs> John, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, more or less uh, talking about a situation that almost uh, there are no rules for, specifically, uh, I understand what we're trying to see here. Drive through their real area, and to be honest, you know, every house is, uh, that you see there is, you know, compliance in a certain sense. So I don't believe that the covered patio uh, on an existing, you know, the roof on an existing patio is, uh, and there's nothing behind this house. It's just a, it's just a park. And I didn't hear any neighbors complaining about the potential plan. So I'm, I'm thinking that the, this is kind of a one-off kind of situation. And uh, I would support the So I, I think um, I kind of agree with Steve on this one. It's, um, you could say it's predates zoning. You could really go either way. I think it gives a little discretion. I don't think it's not a reasonable request. It's not, as John mentioned, there's so much non compliance down there. But I think the zoning board needs to straighten, straighten out the rules. I don't think so. I mean, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be willing to. Do you, do you want me to? I, I'm, I'm, does anyone else want to comment? I'll make a motion. Sort it out that way. So I'd like to make a motion to approve application 24 0755 Dudley Lane. Um, sorry. Will allow variance 3.6C and uh, 3.H. I'm sorry, so 3.6C to allow 20 feet where 30 is required, 3.8 uh, to allow coverage of 118, uh, the hardship being the area being created prior to zoning. 
and it would be very difficult to do anything with the lot. And also that the variance is based on the plans as submitted and that all construction must conform to those plans. Can I get a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. So it passes. Thank you very much. Just like so close to second. Oh, I, I apologize. We gotta do close to I'd like to make a motion that we approve the coastal site plan for application 24 755 w main. We find that the coastal site plan is consistent with the goals and policies of the Coastal Management Act. Can I a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So that's unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate that. Uh, just for what it's worth, I, I should have included it, but I have a postcard of Gunn's camp and it's early 1920s, just based on all the cards that are in the picture. Okay. Thank you. Um, so anybody need a break? Yeah, okay. For a five minute uh, break. <laughs> One second. Second. All approved. Aye. Aye. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, we're now recording and we are now okay. over and we are back in action. So I'd like to ask the applicant for application 24 08 10 Shorelands Drive to please uh, present. Hi, I'm Alex King. I'm one of the owners of Shorelands Drive. Um, it'd be easier for me to talk about it if you Sure. Site Absolutely. Um, so we want to build a 10 by 16, not build it, we're going to put a 10 by 16 Clover Farm shed on our property. Um, and the question is where to put it. Um, because we at Shore, where we are in Shorelands Drive, um, we're between Shorelands and Overshores. Um, so by the town's regulations, we actually have two front yards. Um, and so if you take our property and you were to like divide it into thirds, so there'd be sort of like the Overshore's front yard and the Shoreland's front yard. Um, so yeah, here we are. So we want to put our shed there. Um, so, um, and this is a structure of our house. And we run into problems with the town regulations because, um, Really, technically, the only place we could build our house is like right here um, in sort of at lateral to our house. That's what the regulations say, that we um, can basically put a structure adjacent to our property, sort of this side or that side, um, but not this side. <laughs> which is the actual front yard, because we never knew that we had two front yards um, because there are a lot of trees and stuff like that. We don't, we consider this our backyard actually. Um, but, um, but by town regulations, this is a problem um, because it's offset and it's not uh, within kind of this lateral to our house. Um, so, um, you know, what we're asking for is a variance to build it here um, so that um, we could do that. And we kind of feel like there's really not a lot of room uh, because of setbacks and requirements. Um, there's not a lot of room to kind of build something, um, you know, lateral to our house. Um, and so that's a, a bit of an issue because we have to be six feet from the property line. Um, and then we have to be something like 13 or 14, 14 feet from like the nearest structure of the house. So 14 feet from that corner of our garage. Um, so, um, you know, we'd like this variance to kind of put the shed there. We don't think that it's gonna be a particular hardship to um, 
the good folks of Overshores Drive. Right now, they couldn't even see it because there's like trees. Now, in the winter, yes, they could see it um, because um, the leaves will fall off the trees and they could see into our property. Um, Shorelands Drive folks aren't really going to be able to see this thing at all. Um, and um, there's a, and we're placing it. There's like a stockade fence um, uh, between our property and the Davidsons next door, and so um, uh, you know it it doesn't harm them. Um, so um, we sort of feel like um, this is not a particularly harmful thing, um, and that it's kind of a pain um, if we were to have to to put something um, completely lateral to our house because um, there's just not a lot of area there. And with setback requirements, like, where are you going to put it? Um, so um, that's pretty much it. OK, you want to go over your application? The application just to go through the, some of the numbers on it. We just want to see. It's like going over them just to see what they are. Oh, OK. Yeah. Just for the formality, of it, we've all, we've all seen the final one. But the shed's considered to be in the final Yeah. Yes. So he has. And you're not allowed to bring shed. No, it's that's the section he's there is eleven point right, one. Yes, and because his his property lies in between two streets. Yeah. 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 No, I didn't realize he couldn't bring shed. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to Madison. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So um, yeah, here we are. Um, so we are assessors map 34, lot 46, R3. Um, my name is Alexander Anastasius. I think I'm still on the Zoom call. Um, we prefer, uh, propose to have a, a quarter farm shed that's going to be 10 by 16 feet, have a peaked roof about 10 by 11. Um, it's um, it's going to be cute. It'll be nice. <laughs> It'll be gray. It'll fit with our house, you know. Um, the shed is going to be seven feet from the northern end of our property, um, which we discussed this. So, like, it, it was, we're required six feet, so it's really not much different from six feet. Um, it, it it also meets these kind of regulations of like, if some wind blew the thing over, it's not going to take out um, Tom and Jones. Um, Property, so that was, I guess, part of the logic of it too. Um, so, okay, and then it's four feet from um, the edge, so it could make it line up exactly with the edge of the house. But um, so well, the, the extended line of the house, not the actual house, right? Yeah, it's like so. There's that. There's our house, and then there's like a little passageway to our garage, and then there's like a garage, but the whole thing is considered a continuous structure or whatever for the purposes of this regulation. But you're not just four feet from the building. You're four feet from the extended yeah, line. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, because our property fronts at Overshores Drive and um, Shorelands Drive, it has two front yards. We request a shed uh, that would be considered the front yard with East Overshores Drive. Um, and uh, conditions especially affect this parcel. Most houses um, do not have two front yards. Ours is unique, uh, even for our street. Although, it, I don't know, I've been talking to my neighbors, um, not on your side, Andy, but like on the other side, um, and they seem to think that they go all the way over, but. Um, well, when, when Overshores uh, was built, there was a section of uh, land that was an actual driveway for the very end of Overshore's uh, road. There was a separate driveway for that house. And over the years, when that house was being sold, um, the people, they didn't need, since Overshore's road was put in, they no longer needed that driveway because they have a driveway right off of Overshore's. Uh, Okay. Uh, well, well, okay. Yeah, so we're unusual because we have two front yards, essentially. Um, and what little uh, enforcement of the regs has resulted in a simple, difficult, unusual hardship to add accessory structure, we need to place these. Uh, it was considered our side yard, so it was like all these little buildings all crowded into like this little narrow strip of our lot. Um, 
And um, so a lower house, um, what various, um, what, okay. How will this variance be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the regulation? So I would assume that this regulation was created so that uh, you are not putting your shed like smack in the, you know, right next to the road. Um, so um, your neighbors have to deal with this. Um, this thing's a pretty long way off from um, uh, the, um, the road. So I think it, it kind of fits with the regulations. Like it's, it's everything's kind of stored still kind of in the center of our lot. Um, so the lot is 125 feet um, uh, wide, uh, lot covers 1891. We'd have two oh to make it two oh five one total floor area. You know, it's like a little ten by sixteen shed, so we're adding one hundred sixty square feet. Um, number of stories um, two would still be two. Average building height would still be the same. Um, the total building height is uh, twenty three feet. Um, so that applies to the house, not the shed. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that, that's sufficient. Um, now let me let me ask you, you. You talked about seven feet from the property line. Yeah, uh, I believe that the requirement is basically the drip line. Six. Drip line. Drip six. line it is no more than six. And, okay, so it's or no less than so no the drip less, line. No less than six. The drip line is six feet. But yeah. Okay. All right. So the drip line is not like eight feet from the six. Is that right? Yeah, the drip line is being like the like where, where the water would drip off if there were no gutters or anything like that. Oh, I, no, I think it's something like that. Yeah, it, it's um, we did have with the application a little um, Cloner Farms um, design, um, and then went in and added in the little like the measurements that Cloner Farms provided. I don't know if I had. The height of the drip line there, um, but they're pretty peak roofs, so it's like an eleven foot thing, or eleven mm -hmm. something foot thing, and then the it's, over the wall. It's yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, no, they have it. They are saying it's five feet ten inches. Okay, that answers my question. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, I, on that one. Picture now. You have is, it, is there a fenced in area behind the garage? Yeah. Okay. So that's that's what the shed is closest to. Is that correct? You know, I don't know. Yes, it's what the shed is closest to. I wouldn't call okay. that it's like not a building. It's yeah, a shed. it's a fenced in area. Yeah, it's a fenced in area. Yeah. Making sure we don't have the fifteen foot rule. Okay. okay, that's all the questions I have. Have you ever consider putting the shed in some other part of the property, maybe away from that? Well, if it's two front yards, you can't. It's in the front, that's in the front yard. Yeah, but what he's asking for a variance in the front yard. Right, but both sides. Yeah. You can't move it over there. Well, you can't move it like a back in no, there. That's Okay. Do you, you like the left of the house or the uh, Yeah, I see. Uh, I, don't yeah, I, see. I, I don't know if I'm saying or not, but Mr. King and I had several conversations um, trying to place the shed somewhere, resulting in the fact that you know, we have to ask for a variance. Yeah. Okay. Um, either way, if you put it next to the house, it's too close yeah. to the house. So, um, okay. And so I'll try to put it where he wanted it. This is the back side. The back of the front. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Questions? Could you put it near the playground there? Or, you know, to the side of the playground? That's still, still in front of the front of yard. Yeah. If you put it next to the house, it's got to be 14 feet away. So just, just to, to recap, which I think I gave you guys a, a, a map. Anything past, like if this is the house, anything past the full the frame of the house is considered the front of the house. So we take the footprint of the house and it goes all the way up and butts. So you can't be forward of the house. 
without asking for a variance. The front yard isn't just more than a 40 foot or 20 foot front setback. It's all considered front. And he has two streets, it's two front yards. So technically, I mean, I, I drove by some property today. And, uh, the backyard is just big, tall evergreens. That's a front yard. Very confusing. I guess where I got confused. Yeah, it's zoned, that backyard is zoned as a front yard. So it's actually. There's a shed. <laughs> I guess where I got confused in your application, it said under the, the variance request of 11 1, we request to place the, the shed on what would be considered the front yard with East Overshire Drive. Yeah, yeah. one front yard. Yeah. yeah. Front yard in the East. Yeah, but they're placing it on the side yard, aren't they? Well, it's, well, it's in front of the, anything in front of the house. This is the house, anything over here. It's here. Is the front of the house? Right, so this is the front yard. Right, right. so the shed is house that's in the oh, okay. front yard. Oh, okay, so got it. Got it. He's got it. He's got it. Got it. Okay. okay. He's uh, oh, sure. Thank you. Now I understand. Anybody, any other, anybody from the public wish to speak for or against? My question was answered earlier. I was confused about the front yard uh, situation also, thinking that Overshores, uh, which I would say is his backyard, that's a private road. He has no legal rights to go on that private road. So that should have been obvious that that's his backyard, you know, and his address is. Shoreland Drive, so not over Shore Drive. So. I would like to think people put in anywhere in that, but you guys can hold it to that one spot. Okay, is there any, uh, any comments? Uh, anybody raising their hand on one? Final questions from the board or from the applicant? Would you like to? No, I don't think so. Okay. I'd like to motion we end the public portion of the meeting, uh, of the meeting and go into deliberations. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we'd like to start. I'll start. We've had some, several of these in the past with, with, with two front yards. Sometimes one is on the side and one is on the front. It gets, it gets to be a challenge. And he doesn't have a lot of room just directly in line with the house that kind of restricts access to the back of the house. So yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's a um, small building. It's not, it's not adding a uh, living quarters or anything else. It's, it's just a accessory building um, and it's in a, an area that's unobtrusive and there are no neighbors here opposing it so I think it is probably one of these things where it's the right about leadership. Sure. Two front yards is definitely hard to definitely these things shed some Bill yes it's an unusual hardship due to the peculiar uh, shape of the lot and that results in two front and two front yards so I would go yeah I agree with what was said I have no comment either I, except that I agree with what one of said so I will uh, I'll make a motion in this one to I'd like to make a motion then to approve application 24-0810 Shoreline Shorelands Drive to grant a variance to section 11.1 .1 and the hardship is that the 
property is zoned with two front yards and has no backyard. I'd like to amend that the variance is based on the plans as submitted and that all construction must conform to those plans. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. For that? Yes. Oh, I apologize. Not that we heard from Deep, but we hear from Deep. I apologize. Um, we can probably go over it for a minute. Dr. King, could you um, just review your site plan with us? Post 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 site plan. Okay. Yeah. 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 Are you, you close the public? Uh, well, um, yeah. That's right. That, that's true. Make a motion to reopen the public portion of the hearing. Second. In favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Um, sure. Um, so, um, I guess, is this it? Okay. Um, so we are not in a hundred year floodplain um, and we're not adjacent to a hundred year floodplain. Um, we are coming underneath this because inland from us, there are some flooding areas. Um, so land use site is residential project um, is residential use. Uh, we're not on the water. Um, project site has 21, 27. 1,153 square feet. Um, project after, uh, activity will not disturb five or more acres of land. Um, we're supposed to have place on our quota farm shed. It's going to, um, it, uh, okay, so this is all the same stuff. Um, the last, yeah. yeah. Last paragraph. Something. Okay, so the project will have no impervious cover. So it's going to, sit on like a gravel bed, um, like a pad of aggregates. We're going to have coder farms come in and prepare it for us. Um, I assume it has to be tied down somewhere way, but it, it yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, but um, so um, we do not expect to have any storm runoffs materially different from how it is now, because uh, it's going to just be a shed sitting on a bunch of aggregates. Um, and we actually drink very well in our Area, you know, Sandy. Um, so, um, so I, you know, there was a lot of stuff I just checked not applicable. Um, it, we are within the shorelands definition by that law. Um, so, um, so we do have to do this. Um, the projects, because all possible, so, um, not physically on the water, nor is it adjacent to property on the water, adjacent to a floodplain. A uh, project would have no neglig negligible impact on coastal resources because it's kind of, you know, we're the last street, we're the last house um, on Shorelands Drive, you know, all these houses along Neck, these roads along Neck River. So it's going to be Neck Road, excuse me. And we are the, kind of the last ones in our little road um, um, closest to one in Neck Road. Proposed action uh, is consistent with the proposal use policy standards. It does not result in change of water dependent uses or facilities. So we're not bouncing out any fishermen or anything like that. Um, so, um, and then, yeah, we, was, these are not applicable um, because we're not going in and messing with wetlands or anything like that. It's just a shed on a suburban house. Um, Okay, proposed projects not on the water nor adjacent to the waters so would not impact water dependent uses. Um, and um, project is consistent with the Connecticut Coastal Management Act since it will have minimal adverse impacts. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. I move we close the public hearing again. Move back into our Any deliberations. Is anybody, on the is anybody have any questions? Okay. No second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I move we uh, approve the coastal site plan um, application and that it complies with the Coastal Management Act. I will, I will second that. All in favor? Uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay. Yes, is the answer. Can you just the record? Oh, uh, <laughs> 
I'm not going to motion. I wasn't here last Tuesday. Someone else like to minutes from the uh, April 9th, 2024 meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And I'm abstaining. Okay. You too. So I was in Oh, yeah, I can see me, right? I'm oh, sorry. No, you can vote on that. Well, if you're abstaining, you can just seat me, and then I can vote. But on the minutes, right? Am I wrong? Right. I, I'm, I'm sorry, what? You can vote on the minutes, but not on the... Uh, Did he partake in the meeting? Yes. He was, he's, he's, yeah. Because he was seated. Oh, he was seated. I was probably seated. Yeah, yeah, he was seated for you because you weren't there, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, he, yeah, he was seated. So you can vote on the... Yeah, yes. yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, even though he's not seen them today, he was here for the meeting. Yes. So do you want me to? Do you want no, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Get She'll get it on the record. Is that? Um, did Did you elect chairs and all that last time? Yeah. 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 Okay. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a motion to close? Yeah. Motion uh, to adjourn. So move your chair and vice chair. <laughs> Let's share my okay before we close the meeting. Okay, cool. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye